Good morning again and good afternoon. Um, on behalf of the Middle East Institute and the European Council on Foreign Relations, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, all to this special two-day conference entitled Oslo at 30, Legacies, Hard Realities and Alternatives for Israel-Palestine, which is being convened simultaneously here in Washington and in Brussels, uh, as well as online uh, to our virtual audience. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Khaled Al Gindi. I direct the um, uh, Palestine Israel program here at MEI. Um, I, along with my uh, colleague Hugh Lovett uh, in Brussels at ECFR, will be your conveners for the program today and tomorrow. Exactly two weeks ago, we marked 30 years since the signing of the Oslo Declaration of Principles here in Washington. Many of you remember that historic day and that iconic. A moment of the famous handshake between Yitzhak Rabin, Yasser Arafat, and Bill Clinton. Uh, many of you may even have been there on the South Lawn of the White House. The fact that uh, what was supposed to be a five-year interim arrangement has instead lasted more than three decades is, of course, nothing to celebrate. Um, rather, what we're trying to do here uh, is to use this important milestone anniversary as an opportunity to reflect not only on where we are and how we got here, uh, but more importantly, to begin thinking about what a post-Oslo future for Israelis and Palestinians might look like in terms of both process and outcomes. So this really is, I think, very much a forward-looking uh, initiative. To do that, um, we've assembled what we think is a pretty amazing and diverse uh, set of speakers, um, uh, which includes uh, which include former negotiators and diplomats, scholars, and expert practitioners from Palestine, Israel, uh, the United States, Europe, the Arab world, and the global south, uh, who will be addressing a broad set of issues and ideas. Just a few housekeeping uh, items uh, in terms of format and logistics. As you can see, we have in-person audiences both here and in Brussels, as well as a virtual audience connected via Zoom and live streaming on the MEI website. For those of you joining by Zoom, uh, please remember to use the specialized links for each session. The fact that we are a hybrid conference also means that we have speakers in different locations. Some will be here in Washington, others at the ECFR venue in Brussels, and still others will join by video. Uh, we've done our best to ensure a seamless and integrated experience for everyone. Each session will be 90 minutes long. We have a total of four sessions, uh, two today and two tomorrow. Um, the first half will be moderated discussion followed by a Q and A in the second half. We'll be taking questions, um, Hugh and I and the moderators uh, from participants uh, in each of Washington and Brussels. Coffee and refreshments will be available between the panels in both uh, venues as well. In terms of today's program, uh, this morning we have two panel discussions. The first panel will begin uh, in one minute. Um, panel two will start at 10.45, uh, 4.45 in the afternoon Brussels time. Panel two will be followed by lunch uh, for our Washington participants, so please stick around for that, um, at which point Brussels will move on to a private dinner. Um, with that, I will turn the mic over to Carol Danielle Kaspari, who will moderate our first panel. Uh, Carol is a senior associate uh, director for the conflict resolution program at the Carter Center in Atlanta and is an expert in conflict management, stabilization, and international development. Carol, over to you. Thank you, Khaled, and good morning, everyone. Good morning, and a, word, a warm welcome to our uh, distinguished panelists who I cannot see unless I turn my head. Uh, is there a way to see them and talk to them, Khaled? Uh, we're just standing from here, sitting from here. I think we have to sit in the audience. Sit in the audience. <laughs> uh, looks good. Yeah, this way at least they can see me. Um, and thank you all for being here uh, online and in person. It's really great to have you all here. Uh, our focus for today, as Khalid has mentioned, revolves around a pivotal question or um, um, inquiry. Is the Oslo process, the Oslo Oslo process is, is the failure, is it a failure of implementation or a design? 
Um, so as Khaled have mentioned, the scope of the discussion today, when we mention also the process, thank you so much. The scope of our discussion, when we speak about the Oslo process, we're not merely referring to the specific accord signs in the 90s. Instead, we cast a wider net encompassing the various milestones, uh, such as the 2003 roadmap, the Gaza disengagement, and Fayyad state building plan, and the numerous rounds of US-led negotiations that spanned from 2000 to 2014 among many others. So our panel for today, um, both experts who bring very unique and different perspective to this uh, discourse, I'll introduce uh, them briefly in alphabetical order. So Shlomo Binami, hello Shlomo, is the former uh, foreign minister of Israel. He also served as the minister of public security and Israel's first ambassador to Spain and was on the Israel's delegation to the Madrid Peace Conference. And he's joining us from Tel Aviv. Omar Dajani is a professor of law at uh, University of the Pacific, where he also serves as the co-director of the Law School's Global Center for Business and Development. Hello, Omar. And Ran Greenstein is uh, associate uh, professor of sociology at the University of Witwater, Zand or Witwater Zand. I'm trying to spell it since yesterday and I still can't. Witwaterrand uh, from Johannesburg. And he authors several books on Israel, Palestine, and South Africa conflict. Uh, hello from Johannesburg. And Hi. Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer is a professor of Middle East Policy Studies and Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs. During 29-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service, Ambassador Kurtzer served as a United States Ambassador to Israel and Ambassador to Egypt. Welcome, everyone. So our format is structured to allow each of you approximately 12 minutes uh, for your initial remarks, followed by an engaging Q&A. As Khalid noted, I'm um, repeating, while we have virtual audience, only those physically present in Washington and in Brussels, uh, will have the opportunity to pose questions directly. So kicking off our discussion, uh, Shlomo bin Ami, would you please provide us insights from the Israeli perspective on the reasons behind the failure uh, of the Oslo process? The floor is yours. Unmute. Okay, uh, I think that uh, I should start by paraphrasing uh, Trevelyan's verdict on the 1848 revolution. Uh, one could say of Oslo that it was the turning point at which history failed to turn. It was a failure of both design and implementation. But it was also an exercise, a brilliant exercise in track two or other uh, one and a half diplomacy that secured a historic mutual recognition uh, between two national movements that had been fighting for over a century over the, sa the same piece of land. But for the Israelis, as it transpires and in a recently declassified protocol, it was to a large degree about the hope that Arafat could be the subcontractor of Israel's security and thus stem, stem the rise of Hamas. The two leaders, Rabin and Arafat, came to Oslo out of a certain degree or different certain degrees of, of, of despair and misconceptions about each other's objectives. Rabin did it only after failing to reach an agreement with Hafez al-Assad in Syria, and Arafat needed to recover the PLO's preeminence after having supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, a strategic blunder that perhaps mirrored uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini's support of Nazi Germany during World War II. It was all a clash of expectations between Palestinian dreams about a clear-cut process of decolonization 
and Rabin's idea of a Palestinian autonomy as the end game, not a transition to it. Nor did Shimon Peres ever really support the Palestinian state, even when he said that he did. The Israelis looked for a solution to the problems born in 1967 and found themselves clashing against the wall of 1948. No Israeli commitment to hold expansion of settlements, let alone dismantle them, uh, was in the Oslo uh, Accord. No system of international observation, no mechanism of uh, sanctions for the violator of the agreement. It was all built on the wrong assumption that trust could be built on uh, uh, um, between the, the occupier, the land ha uh, hungry occupier and the occupied. Now a divisive peace such as Israel's Palestine requires the co-optation of the state bureaucracy and institutions into the system, particularly the army. But the IDF was left out of Oslo and became throughout the process a recalcitrant, recalcitrant companion of it. The securitization of peace and the army's failure to see the opportunities, not just the risk, stimulated the vision of those among us working for a historic final deal. Abu Allah used to say to me, you guys run this process as if you are getting ready for the next war. Shaul Mofaz, chief of staff during the, uh, the Clinton uh, Barak negotiations, went to the public with a warning that the Clinton parameters are an, or were an existential threat. Arafat was by nature of his condition, a, a destabilizer who by pushing the Israeli side to the outer edges of Palestinian dreams, destroyed the political standing of every Israeli leader that tried to negotiate a final deal. Sharon dodged such a threat by opting for unilateralism. He would not enter the Corrales leading to political suicide. So in the second Intifada, Israel reduced again the Palestinian question to an autonomy mode by ousting Arafat, reconstructing Palestinian security forces in a way that would meet the needs of the occupier and recovering the freedom of action in Palestinian cities that had been handed over to the Palestinians in the interim agreement. This is exactly now a, a, a portrait of the conditions right now. It also proved impossible it also proved impossible for every Israeli government that came after uh, uh, Rabin to meet Palestinian expectations. Let us also remember that the Paris Protocol was an integral part of Oslo in many ways, and it subjected Palestinian economy to a total dependence on the Israeli economy. It was all part of the subjection of the Palestinian people to Israel's dominion. One uh, can, of course, argue, and there are those who do it today, that the Gordian knot needed to be cut at once. Otherwise, you leave the process at the mercy of uh, the radicals, as, as this was indeed the case. For Oslo sowed the seeds of its own demise through its constructive ambiguity regarding the nature of the final settlement that became a minefield for future negotiators. But to Rabin and to all others, cutting the Gordian knot at once was a political night nightmare. Dates are not sacrosanct, he used to say to Arafat. He doubted the capacity of the Palestinians to comply and he was insecure about his political power base. Not even the Barak and the Ormert governments the first through the Clinton parameters and the second through his 2008 uh, proposals to Mahmoud Abbas could guarantee that they could handle the political earthquake that follows that would follow the implementation of their peace offers. 
Now, the notion that Rabin's assassination killed the process is a delusion. This is the elevation to mythical heights of the slain prime minister. Sooner or later, Rabin would have arrived to the same dead point in which all Israeli negotiators of a final settlement got trapped. When Rabin was assassinated, he was already politically crippled by a series of devastating suicide bombings. By pushing the boundaries of Israel's capacity for compromise, Camp David, the Clinton parameters, and the Annapolis pro, uh, proposals, and their reject rejection set the stage for the rise of Israel's an annexationist far right, as it is epitomized today by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's proto-fascist coalition. Today, the entire area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean is now effectively a single state where disenfranchised Palestinians live under one of the most sophisticated systems of, of occupation in modern history. I would then counsel against the notion that the two-state solution, as we understood it, at the turn of the century is still in the offing. A recent Carnegie Endowment paper called for a Palestinian struggle for civil liberties as the prelude for political independence. But, but Palestinians, particularly in the younger generation, have lost faith in political independence, that is in a Palestinian state. Like the Israeli right, they want a one state solution. Separation is the dream of liberal Israel and of the political relic that is the Israeli left. Integration is the plan of the radical right now in power in a country that has moved radically to the right, but they speak of an integration that is subject to Jewish racial supremacy. We are declining now then into a South African situation that I am afraid does not have a South African solution. The most that can be now achieved is mitigation. And the US needs to return to its old levels of engagement. The US in this particular case remains the indispensable state or nation. A monument to Oslo's failure, the Abraham Accords that are the product of American diplomacy and the possible integration of Saudi Arabia into them represent a radical change of paradigm for Oslo was about a Palestinian peace being the precondition for an Israeli-Arab reconciliation. This now has been turned on its head. Jordan and Palestinian, I believe, need to be integrated into a, a regional fr framework that should leverage the new geopolitical setup in order to start again empowering Palestinians to, 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 to secure their, uh, their, their capabilities, both economically and security-wise. Stop Israeli uh, annexations uh, an accession drive, make possible additional redeployments, and perhaps makes a slight, a slight change in uh, the distribution of areas uh, B and C, these sort of things perhaps. I, I believe that an agreement with Saudi Arabia that fails to dissolve Netanyahu's coalition of messianic settlers would merely represent a cosmetic adjustment orchestrated perhaps by uh, the astute politician that, Netan that Netan Netanyahu is. Now, the chances for Israel, since it has ruled out the two-step solution as we understood it in the past, is to recover the DNA of Zionism, what I believe is the DNA of Zionism, 
more about demography than territory. A center-left government that might come to office in some future, nobody knows. Historians and prophets can never agree on these kind of things. So a center-left government at some point down the road might like to recover that DNA just as Sharon did in Gaza. And if there is no uh, um, bilateral or regional agreement, this might push that liberal Israel or that liberal or centrist Israeli government to um, to go back to the Olmert's idea of some sort of a convergent plans. Such a withdrawal can be a calamity for both the Palestinians and uh, Jordan. And perhaps would force it, as it did in 2007 and 2008, to consider a more robust engagement in the questions of Palestine. So Oslo bypassed Madrid by going straight to an exclusive Palestinian solution, because Madrid was based on a sort of Jordanian-Palestinian uh, um, arrangement. Oslo failed. Since this entire process was a voyage of trial and error, and the solution based on international legitimacy is ideal but utterly unrealistic, why not include Madrid in the diminishing menu of offers right now? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Slomo, for your insights. Uh, if we could uh, now turn to Omar, please. And I forgot to mention that Omar was also a former advisor uh, to uh, the negotiations um, on, from the Palestinian side, and he participated also in Camp David talks. So Omar, I'm turning to you now to shed a light on whether the shortcomings of the uh, Oslo process to the main question of this panel, is it an issue of implementation or design? Thanks very much. Um, and I join my uh, uh, fellow panelists also in uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, before turning to the topic that we're here to discuss and the question that you posed, Carol, I'd like to speak for a moment about the uh, circumstances surrounding uh, my participation today. Um, as uh, many of you may be aware, uh, a number of speakers who were scheduled to participate in this conference uh, chose to withdraw in deference to a call by the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Uh, particular concerns were raised about uh, participating opposite Dr. Ben-Ami um, uh, in light of his having served as Minister of Internal Security um, during the early months of the Second Palestinian Intifada at a time when uh, 13 uh, Palestinian demonstrators were killed by Israeli police. I respect other speakers' decisions not to participate today. Uh, and I wanna stress that I generally support the call for boycotts, divestment and sanctions, which um, I see as a nonviolent means of raising the costs to Israel, of perpetuating a one state reality that has appropriately been called apartheid by leading human rights organizations. Indeed, I think that the BDS movement is a necessary response to the marginalization of international law and of Palestinian rights, needs, and concerns that was a hallmark of the Oslo process. But having said that, I think it's crucially important for Palestinian perspectives to be heard in gatherings of this kind, which necessarily draw on uh, people uh, with different experiences and perspectives um, in a policy context uh, that Palestinians cannot be um, uh, absent from. And it strikes me as a strategic error to base a decision not to participate on the affiliation or past record of other speakers. This is not 
I should stress, a forum in which Palestinians are being tokenized or uh, one in which a dynamic of false parity between the two sides is being promoted as uh, Dr. Ben-Ami's remarks just a few moments ago um, uh, illustrated. To the contrary, the organizers of this event have made a careful effort to plan two days of critical and inclusive discussion that centers Palestinian voices and experiences. Obviously, this is not the forum or the occasion to talk about our boycott strategy and the process through which decisions about it are taken. But I do hope that there will be an opportunity for Palestinians and for other supporters of Palestinian rights to engage soon in a candid and rigorous discussion of these matters. Having said that, uh, let me now uh, turn to the question that, uh, that Carol posed. I was a first year student uh, back in 19, first year law student back in 1993, when the first of the Oslo agreements was signed on the White House lawn. And I remember the optimism I felt uh, watching the ceremony on television in the student lounge. Um, that feeling to be sure diminished uh, once I had the opportunity actually to study what had been written. And it declined further some years later when I was working as a lawyer on the team that undertook to negotiate a permanent status agreement in the shadow of the Oslo Accords. But despite the seriousness of the Accords design flaws, which Shlomo has pointed to, and I'll discuss as well, I don't think that today's reality was an inevitable consequence of them. As I'll explain later, I believe the United States could have played a useful role in compensating for the Accords weaknesses. Its choice not to do so should be recognized as the policy failure that it was. But let me start by highlighting what I think uh, were the Oslo Accords primary design flaws. First, while the agreements appeared to uh, establish a framework for bilateral decision-making, their more consequential feature was that they offered cover for unilateral action by Israel. Whereas the PLO had recognized the state of Israel, renounced not only terrorism, but all forms of armed resistance and accepted a jurisdictional scheme that placed onerous limits on the powers and territorial reach of the newly created Palestinian Authority. Israel largely kept its options open. Um, although the parties had agreed that the arrangements they established would be transitional, the accord said little about what um, and uh, about from what and to what they were making a transition. Israel did not acknowledge that the West Bank and Gaza Strip were occupied territory, nor did it uh, um, explicitly recognize the Palestinians' right to self-determination and statehood, um, limiting itself instead to an oblique acknowledgement of the, quote, legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. In that sense, the mutual recognition that Shlomo referred to uh, in his remarks was in some respects asymmetrical. This vagueness regarding the ultimate outcome of the process may have made it easier to get negotiations started but it made it much harder for the parties to conclude them successfully, encouraging hard bargaining and creating opportunities for backsliding when new governments came to power in Jerusalem. In addition, three specific features of the Oslo Accords enabled Israel to act unilaterally to deepen the occupation even while peace talks were in progress. First, the Accords jurisdictional scheme left Israel in full control of most of the West Bank during the interim period, including many of the areas that Israeli politicians and planners had long targeted for acquisition on ideological or strategic grounds. The Accords did nothing to constrain those ambitions. Indeed, they facilitated them by creating an open field for action. Second, the Accords' many ambiguous formulations regarding for example, um, how much territory would be transferred to Palestinian jurisdiction in the interim period or ultimately, how many Palestinian prisoners would be uh, freed and whether settlement activity would be allowed to continue during the interim period. Ambiguities about all of these things gave Israeli leaders discretion to interpret their commitments 
as they liked. Third, the Accords lack of a third party dispute resolution mechanism, something that Israel, Israel insisted could not be in the Accords following its unhappy experience with the Taba arbitration with Egypt. The lack of a third party dispute resolution mechanism left the Palestinians with few avenues for challenging bad faith interpretation of the agreements. Now, I think it's important to emphasize that there were, of course, segments of the Israeli political spectrum that pressed for scrupulous adherence, not only to the letter, but also to the spirit of uh, the peace process that uh, the parties had engaged in. But the features of the agreements that I've just mentioned gave opponents of the peace process countless opportunities to limit and stall implementation. Um, and gave leaders uh, like uh, Perez and like Rabin um, very little room to say the agreements um, oblige me to take action um, of the following kind. In the end, minimal territory and deeply circumscribed powers were transferred to the PA while Israel steadily absorbed the areas that remained under its full control through the accelerated construction of settlement housing, roads, and other infrastructure. A second design flaw uh, of the Oslo Accords was that they marginalized international law as a tool of conflict resolution, supplanting it with a system that effectively formalized the inherent asymmetry between occupier and occupied. Every single change to the status quo had to be negotiated between uh, the two sides, with Palestinians almost always cast in the role of supplicant. Um, even clear obligations under international law, such as the prohibition of settlement activity and the requirement to hold occupied territories resources in trust for the local population were characterized as matters for negotiation and requiring compromise from the Palestinians. This sidelining of international law and the agreements moreover was carried forward into negotiations regarding the permanent status when we would evoke even fundamental norms of international law, the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by force, the self-determination of peoples and key tenets of humanitarian law, we were accused of being unrealistic and ungrateful. And not only by our Israeli colleagues, also by um, American intermediaries, including presidents of the United States. And that brings me to uh, the point uh, that I started with. Uh, the many flaws of the Oslo process notwithstanding, I think it's important to emphasize that the one state reality that we face today would not have come into being had the international community been prepared to hold Israel to account for violations of the agreements and more broadly for of international law. Examples of this abound, but I'd like to focus on the peace that is maybe most significant in view of the reality that is unfolding before us um, in the occupied territory today. And that is of course the failure of the United States and others uh, to take action with respect to the issue of settlements. Four times, four times between 1993 and 2016, the United States exercised its veto, uh, preventing the United Nations Security Council from taking uh, measures to um, condemn Israeli settlement activity and create a framework uh, for uh, creating costs uh, uh, associated with that activity. In addition, at crucial junctures, as the Oslo process began to unravel, when the Mitchell Committee, which was established um, just after uh, the beginning of the uh, Second Palestinian Intifada to uh, both uh, determine what had happened and to try to uh, chart a way forward, when the Mitchell Committee um, uh, urged that settlement activity be addressed as one of the main causes of uh, the uh, violence that erupted, uh, the United States took action to ensure that uh, it would not be treated as a uh, precondition for uh, further action on the diplomatic front. 
Similarly, within the context of uh, the roadmap process, which I was involved with uh, from um, uh, a later role in the United Nations, um, even though the other partners um, in the roadmap process, the United Nations Secretariat, uh, the European Union, uh, and the Russian Federation had all agreed uh, that settlement activity should be um, not only condemned as illegal as it is, but also monitored um, with a view toward ensuring compliance with international law um, and Israel's obligations under the Fourth Geneva Convention. The United States, again, stood in the way of uh, action of that kind, um, suggesting, as it had for 15 years, that um, parallel processes in these other contexts um, uh, that centered Israel would uh, not be tolerated. As we look at the power dynamics that we see um, unfolding on the ground today, and as we see a reality of apartheid um, uh, uh, firmly take hold, um, making opportunities for uh, the kind of peace that we imagined uh, uh, to be uh, uh, impossible. I think it's important for us to look back and ask ourselves um, whether things might have been different, not only if the Oslo Accords had been written differently, um, not only if leaders like uh, Robin and Perez had had a different view about what the process they were entering into um, actually obliged from them, but if third parties like the United States um, had stood by uh, their responsibility uh, to ensure compliance with international law. Thank you. Thank you all much, so much for this perspective, for this intervention and your insights. I'm gonna uh, go over now to Ambassador Dan Kurtzer with your extensive diplomatic career. We eagerly anticipate your insights into the reasons of Oslo's failure, please. Well, thank you, Carol. Thank you, Khaled and Middle East Institute for sponsoring this, uh, this conference. Uh, let me start by answering the question that was posed in the title of this session, a failure of design or implementation. The answer is yes. Uh, and I think as Omar uh, has indicated uh, really quite astutely, uh, the design flaws in Oslo uh, stood out from the beginning and continued to impair the process throughout. Uh, what I want to do, though, for the next few minutes is to transport us back to 1993, uh, because knowing the end of this story, it's too easy to read back into Oslo uh, the reasons for its uh, weaknesses and uh, ultimate failure to provide a solution to the conflict. But if we go back to 1993, um, we at least perhaps can understand uh, the processes that contributed to uh, Oslo's failure to produce uh, what everyone seemed to want at the time. Now recall, first of all, uh, that uh, the United States uh, had gone through its own political transition between uh, having helped arrange the Madrid Peace Conference in 1991 and then Oslo in 1993. Uh, and that's a critical starting point because with the Bush administration, the, George H.W. Bush administration had demonstrated was that for it, uh, the realization of Palestinian Israeli and Arab Israeli peace was a critical national security interest. Uh, the Clinton administration uh, illustrated no such commitment. In fact, uh, the choice of Secretary of State and the early uh, policies of the Clinton administration indicated that foreign policy writ large and the Middle East peace process specifically were not at the top of the American agenda. Uh, this was demonstrated by the downgrading of our representation from the Secretary of State, James Baker, who uh, ran the day-to-day -day activities leading up to Madrid uh, to the creation of a special Middle East coordinator office that not only uh, took the issue out of the Secretary of State's hands, but also took it out of the hands of the Near East Bureau at the State Department, which meant that a good deal of whatever expertise the State Department had um, was not going to be necessarily part of the process, number one. Number two, uh, in the uh, period after uh, Madrid, the United States uh, shepherded uh, the uh, bilateral negotiations that took place in Washington. 
uh, and immediately faced uh, one of the design flaws of Madrid, and that was uh, Palestinian representation. You recall that uh, for Secretary Baker, the only way to get to Madrid was to incorporate uh, compromises and concessions that uh, we knew at the time were very challenging and were going to create problems down the road. In particular, the question of the joint Palestinian-Jordanian delegation. Uh, the Jordanians didn't like it. The Palestinians didn't like it. You recall the picture of Palestinians and Jordanians sitting on a bench in the State Department outside of the conference room because both of them refused to go into the conference room as a joint delegation. So there were design flaws in Madrid, but the assumption was that once a process was launched, uh, a reality uh, would set in and uh, the parties would find a way to overcome those uh, challenges. In that respect, I would point you uh, to one of the most important early meetings in uh, both the Clinton administration and the Rabin administration. And that was Rabin's visit to Washington in February of 1993. By that time, the contacts between Israel and the PLO or between Israeli academics and the PLO had already begun. They had started a month earlier in London under the auspices of the Norwegians. Uh, the United States was informed of those contacts. In fact, uh, as is now known, I was the conduit for information from both the Israelis and the Norwegians about what was going on in that channel. So we knew that there were these uh, uh, contacts underway. Uh, Oslo was not the only contact between Israel and the PLO. Nabil Shath and uh, other Israelis were also meeting largely as a result of change in Israeli legislation that uh, made it not unlawful for Israelis to meet with the PLO. So there were a number of these uh, uh, beginnings that were being talked about. And then you had this Rabin visit in Washington in early 1993, when in diplomatic terms, a quite extraordinary event occurred. Rabin asked to meet with the so-called peace team without the Secretary of State. And he wanted to essentially deliver a soliloquy. And it related to the fact that on the one hand, Rabin had no use for the PLO and particularly no use for Yasser Arafat. And on the other hand, Rabin understood that without the PLO and without Yasser Arafat, there would be no progress made at all with the delegation that was negotiating in Washington. And so in this soliloquy, and I use that word advisedly because the team of which I was then a part largely was an audience. We didn't participate very much because Rabin monopolized this uh, meeting. Rabin was thinking out loud, how do I bring or allow or encourage the PLO to come into this process when I don't trust them? And when they've been our enemy, a sworn enemy, and I would just as soon continue to consider the PLO an enemy as to bring them into a peace process. As we know, uh, a couple of months later, not only did uh, Israel and the PLO reach this imbalanced, asymmetrical, as uh, Omar indicated, mutual recognition, but it was done with Rabin's full involvement. Because by May of 1993, when Rabin was brought fully into the process that was underway in Oslo, uh, he assigned his lawyer, Joel Singer, many of you know him here in Washington, and a senior Israeli diplomat, uh, Uri Savir, to oversee the talks that had previously been conducted with Israeli academics, which had given Israel a kind of escape hatch that the PLO didn't have uh, with PLO officials fully involved. So by mid-1993, there was this process underway uh, with the full understanding of both the PLO and Israel designed to overcome one of the key essential flaws of the Madrid process. Now, as Omar indicated, and I, I would ascribe entirely to his remarks about design flaws in Oslo. And in fact, the earliest analysis of those design flaws was written by Haider Abdel Shafi, the 
chief Palestinian negotiator in Washington in an article he wrote in, must have been 93 or 94 in the Journal of Palestine Studies, where he essentially um, dissected the Oslo Accords against what had been negotiated or being negotiated in the Washington talks. And I would point you to one aspect of uh, Hyder Abdul Shafi's analysis. In those Washington talks, which Aaron Miller and I had been instructed to follow and in a way to participate in, we weren't in the room for all of the talks, but we were in the room for a good number of the talks. In those Washington talks, a declaration of principles was being negotiated that was far, far stronger than what emerged in Oslo. Declaration of Principles uh, in a US draft that was put on the table in late May, early June of 1993 included issues that were absent from Oslo. Uh, jurisdiction, uh, control over land, uh, the kinds of powers and responsibilities that would change the concept that had been in vogue of personal autonomy into a serious uh, governance capability. Both Rabin and Arafat rejected the US draft. And it's important to know that because this was not simply a concern of Rabin that there was too much power in the US draft being assigned to the PLO, but Arafat, who would have to answer for this himself, probably understood that because Rabin didn't like the draft, it may have ended the process of bringing the PLO into the process itself. And so an effort in Washington, which uh, actually started out in much stronger terms than what ended up in Oslo, uh, failed. And we ended up with an Oslo Accord with all of the design flaws that uh, Omar uh, uh, indicated in his remarks and that Hader al Shafi uh, wrote about. And what that led to in some respects was a process that having gotten off, not just on the wrong foot, but on the wrong feet, uh, was almost impossible to recover. Now, in one sense, one could make the argument that Oslo ended the moment it was signed on the White House lawn. What do I mean? Oslo got us started. It launched a negotiation between Israel and the PLO, and that negotiation then took on its own dynamics. The process of peacemaking has not succeeded or has failed as a result of elements of failure within the process of negotiations. They're related to Oslo, but they're much more related in my view to uh, flaws in the way in which all of us negotiated. And I wanna underline the words, all of us. There was an Haaretz article maybe a week or two ago uh, in which they interviewed, I guess, five of us on the American side who had participated in this process. And they used one of my quotes as their subheadline. And that quote, which I love to quote myself, said, <laughs> uh, we all blew it. Uh, and I come back to that because um, over these years since Madrid, since Oslo, the argument I have made to my Palestinian and Israeli counterparts is do what we've tried to do in the United States. And that is look in the mirror. It's easy to blame Israel for all of the policies and practices that have led us to where we are as a result of those policies and practices. And it's equally easy to blame the Palestinians for their policies and practices that have led us. But they need to do that self-assessment. It's not something that we need to do uh, for them. Rather, looking in the mirror, uh, I point to failures of American diplomacy, and American policy, some of which were referred to by Omar, but which need to be emphasized. I think number one, as Omar indicated, the dispute or the absence of a dispute resolution mechanism in the Oslo Accords uh, was a serious flaw because it uh, allowed the parties to disagree without a methodology or an agreed methodology for resolving disputes. Now, Reference was made to Taba. I spent seven, almost eight years of my life focusing on the Taba dispute. I think all of you know what that was. 
over one square kilometer of the Sinai Peninsula, whether or not Israel would return it as part of its commitment to evacuate all of the territories it occupied in 1967. The beauty of Taba was that it proved the value of a dispute resolution mechanism. As long as it took to resolve that dispute without the two sides going to war, it validated the idea that having a dispute resolution mechanism, <clears throat> which the parties would use, uh, could lead them to a peaceful uh, outcome. But the corollary of not having a dispute resolution mechanism was not having a monitoring and accountability mechanism. Because the dispute resolution mechanism kicks in once there's a formal dispute of some, some manner between the parties. The absence of a monitoring and accountability mechanism should be at play throughout the process. So if there is a new settlement, there should be a monitoring capability that calls out Israel for their settlement activities inconsistent with its obligations. If there is Palestinian violence or terrorism, which is not pushed back against by the PLO, then the PLO would need to be called into question for uh, its failure to abide by its commitment of renunciation of terrorism and violence. And yet there was no accountability and monitoring mechanism throughout this process. In fact, the only time or the first time, there are actually two such efforts, both of them fairly weak. The first time that such a mechanism was put into play was when there was a, sh a very brief effort to implement the uh, so-called roadmap. And Washington sent out a relatively senior US diplomat, except the monitoring that that diplomat did was never reported to anybody and never had any consequences. And so the parties could continue their bad behavior. The United States was the scribe marking down all of these bad behaviors and it went into the files. Some historian 30 years from now will open those files and see that we probably did a relatively good job of watching the parties fail to carry out their commitments under Madrid and Oslo. But the utilization of that record in trying to hold the party's feet to the fire in their, in their negotiations uh, failed uh, miserably. Uh, secondly, uh, US negotiating posture during this period uh, needs to be called into question. And again, I'm looking in the mirror. I'll allow uh, Shlomo and uh, Omar and I hope they continue to look in the mirror themselves to analyze Palestinian and Israeli uh, uh, faults in this regard. But the United States during this period, uh, both after Madrid and particularly after Oslo, having downgraded our representation and having made very clear to the parties that the peace process was not as high a priority as it had been assigned in the uh, George H. Bush H.W. Uh, Bush administration, um, the United States simply was in a way absent from the role that we needed to play. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that we were actually absent from <clears throat> the uh, negotiating efforts. For example, I was assigned in May of 1994 to help the Israelis and Palestinians in Cairo uh, finalize what became the May 4th, 1990 for agreement that led to Gaza Jericho. Uh, the parties had reached a point where they uh, had failed to narrow their differences and uh, coming with a mandate from Washington to finalize the May 4th Accord, uh, the parties uh, overcame that uh, last hurdle. Uh, we also helped in 1995 in September in the so-called Oslo II Accords but in the day-to-day -day negotiations, in the day-to-day -day effort to oversee and to intrude into the negotiations, to avoid the uh, differences of view that would escalate and widen, uh, the United States largely failed. Now, if Aaron Miller were here, who, as I said, together with, with him, uh, he and I had been assigned to follow the Palestinian uh, negotiations in uh, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. You know, Aaron Miller has uh, written uh, about the United States role in largely uh, 
becoming, quote unquote, Israel's lawyer. He doesn't like us to mention this, and I hope he's not watching this because I'll hear from him in about an hour. But the reality is that we did act largely in support of Israel's negotiating positions. We cleared much of our own negotiating efforts with Israel in advance. We did that throughout the 90s. We did it at Camp David in a manner that uh, undermined a US draft that was put on the table without much preparation. And therefore the negotiating practice of the United States in this period uh, was very faulted. Now, I, I could go on and could write a book about, well, I did, um, uh, and uh, it's highly recommended. Uh, but the point of this is that uh, if we go back to the uh, outset, uh, design and implementation, uh, this uh, process unfortunately uh, failed. Uh, and the negotiating process that resulted from Madrid and Oslo failed. I would only quote uh, Shlomo uh, in one of the last comments he made today, and that is, uh, are we fated to uh, live now with a one state reality. Uh, and I don't believe we are. And I don't believe we are because if I analyze not my own policy, American policy, but if I analyze Israeli and Palestinian views and policies, they don't want a one state reality, which means that we have to find a way to separate, to allow Palestinians the full expression of self determination, including if they want an independent, serious state. And we have to find a way to bring these two parties back into a process which allows them to uh, reach an agreement that uh, results in a two-state solution. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ambassador Dan, for your generous contributions, for your invite to look at the mirror, and for these reflections on the behind the scenes and very, very insightful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, turning now to uh, Professor Ran, uh, uh, he's renowned for uh, his expertise in comparative conflict resolution. So please, uh, Professor Ran, if you could provide us with your valuable uh, perspective on how Oslo process compares to similar endeav endeavors such as a South Africa one. Uh, I think you're muted. Okay, um, thank you. My approach is a bit different from that of the previous uh, speakers. I would like to shed light on the process by using a comparative perspective. And fortunately, we have a perfect case study to use here, that of uh, South Africa, which fits both in terms of the time frame and the substance of the issues involved. When Oslo was being negotiated, a similar process was unfolding in South Africa. It led to the demise of apartheid and the creation of a unified legal political framework for all citizens of the country. It culminated with the first democratic elections in the country's history in April, 1994. The South African transition did not solve all social and political problems, far from it. But these problems are being handled through the new institutions and policy frameworks that were created in the 1990s. There is no going back to apartheid, no challenges to the post-apartheid political order. In contrast to that, the debate around Oslo is framed under the sign of failure, as this panel indicates. The balance of forces increasingly became more skewed towards Israeli interests and concerns at the expense of their Palestinian counterparts. And the centerpiece of the process, Palestinian independence, has become increasingly more remote over time. Why this difference in outcomes? Three things stand out. First, in South Africa, the process was internal. All discussions took place inside the country involving forces equally local to it. They negotiated about their homeland from a position of relative equality. Both sides realized that they reached a stalemate. The regime could not be dislodged by force and it could not rule the country without the consent of the people. 
There was no need for neutral foreign ground and external mediation. Second, the negotiation process was open to the public. This ensured transparency and popular involvement, but it also gave rise to serious disruptions, which were handled before the process was concluded. Among these disruptions was a massive wave of township violence fueled by elements in the security forces. The assassination of Chris Honey, perhaps the most popular leader after Mandela in the country. The attack on the site of negotiations in Kempton Park by the AWB, Africana Resistance Movement, and the white right wing raid on the Boputatswana homeland in an effort to stop its reintegration into South Africa. All these attempts to derail the process failed. The main negotiating partners, the National Party on the side of the government and the ANC collaborated to maintain the overall course against detractors from all sides. By early 1994, all the stumbling blocks placed by elements in the security forces, the white right wing and ethnic African tribalists had been removed which allowed the post-apartheid period to be launched without serious challenges ahead of it. Third, the process addressed all central issues, even though not always completely or satisfactorily. Important concerns, restitution of land in particular, were left to future arrangement of a practical nature. Many promises regarding equality, redress, redistribution were not fulfilled later on, but that was a result of policy choices made by post-apartheid government. It was not a result of a flow in the negotiation process itself. What made this process pos possible? It unfolded within an agreed framework of shared national identity which served to marginalize other bases for identity, including race, ethnic nationalism, and tribalism. At the same time, the process was premised on the need to dismantle the colonial foundations of South African society. It addressed the legacies of historical wrongs, the denial of citizenship to millions, systematic racial discrimination, and land dispossession. The negotiations did not offer immediate solution to all these issues, but they handled them, they put them on the agenda. How does the Oslo process look in comparison? Oslo was negotiated in secret between politicians and diplomats. Popular constituency were faced with a final product that was prepared without their knowledge or consent. Some of them developed a motivation for disruption after it had come into effect. Further, Oslo avoided discussing key issues with, which threatened to blow it apart. This choice came back to haunt it. In particular, it did not recognize the colonial foundations of the Israeli-Palestine question, the historical dispossession of the Nakba, and the ongoing settlement process in the occupied territories, which became the main obstacle to progress. In fact, the Israelis insisted on not dealing with settlers and settlements, but that was a grave mistake, even from their own perspective. It allowed settlers to expand their territory and influence, consolidate their opposition, and increase their capacity to undermine the process. Among Palestinians, the failure to deal with historical foundation left a critical constituency, the 1948 refugees marginalized, and in that way, it facilitated the rise of political rejectionism and violent resistance in Gaza and overall. In conceptual terms, Oslo treated the conflict as a relationship between neighbors over borders and sovereignty. It did not define Palestinians and their territories, either as internal or external to Israel. Effectively, Oslo operated within the paradigm of autonomy as previously advanced by the Alon plan of the 1960s and the Begin plan of the 1970s. The result was that Palestinians were placed in a subordinate position without achieving recognition as full partners 
by Israel and its international allies. In addition, Israel's position as holding the physical assets necessary for any move forward, marginalized Palestinians even further. Possession is nine tenths of the law and territorial control allowed Israel to determine the pace of the process and even stop it altogether. A contrast with Southern Africa is useful. In South Africa, the foundation stone for the process was the need to create a unified citizenship for all residents and remove the legal basis of colonialism and apartheid. In neighboring Namibia, in the same period, also around 1990, the foundation stone was the right to independence of the local population, which included a substantial white minority. Oslo did not offer citizenship to Palestinians and did not recognize their independence in whichever boundaries. Palestinians found themselves in a limbo. The road to equal citizenship was blocked. The road to independence was open in principle, but became increasingly narrow over time to the point of disappearing altogether. What prevented a better solution at the time? That's where the question of design comes in. First, I'll use a term coined by Israeli analyst and historian, Meron Benbenisti. He called it the settler DNA, the imperative of land acquisition and extension of Jewish settlement, creating an ever expanding zone in which Jewish supremacy remains in force. Second, the dominance of an exclusionary ethno-national identity, which does not accept any group or entity that challenges the boundaries of the Israeli Jewish collective. Third, the security paradigm, which looks at the so-called Arab question primarily through the gun sites. What is the bottom line then? The problem with Oslo is not a matter of implementation. It is a failure of design. Looking at the issue as involving competing national movements. Nationalism is a component of the situation, of course, but it must be seen together with another component, a process of colonial settlement that aims to displace and replace the indigenous population. That process cannot be reversed, but the focus must be on a radical shift in its direction. The first step is to recognize it for what it is and has been for decades, at least since 1967, but in fact since 1947, if not even earlier, I don't want to go all the way to 1917. The second step is to stop its further expansion. The third step is to think creatively how to move forward. Just to give an example, the options are not leaving settlements as they are or evacuating them they could be demilitarized and opened up to all those who wish to live in them, regardless of religion and ethnicity. This has been the case in practice with Jewish only settlements inside Israel of Upper Nazareth and Carmiel inside the Green Line. It's not an ideal solution, but it may be more practical than evacuation or retention. But how can that be achieved politically? The different histories and global contexts mean that in Israel-Palestine, there is no possibility in the short to medium term of developing a unified sense of identity, national identity, shared by Israelis and Palestinians alike. The South African rainbow nation cannot be replicated elsewhere. But all is not lost. The conditions for a move beyond Oslo and its failures include forging Palestinian unity by combining demands that would meet the concern of different constituencies, internal citizens, occupied residents, refugees. Popular mobilization around this demand is essential. Mobilizing a committed minority of Israeli Jews to shift away from the exclusionary ethno-national Jewish identity. The current process movement offers some hope without any guarantees, of course, in this regard, and finally creating alliances across the ethno-national divide. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Ron. Um, we have uh, 20 minutes left, so we would like to prioritize questions from the audience here and in Brussels. So if we could move the microphone uh, or we yeah. could collect them. 
questions. So if you could raise your hand, we'll take a couple questions from here in Washington. We'll take a, we'll take a couple questions from here and then we'll take a few questions from Brussels. Um, do we have, you have a mic? Okay, great. Great. Uh, so we have, let's start here and then work our way that way. Thank you. Alexander Lungerov uh, from the EU and uh, International Law Institute in Leuven. Uh, thank you for your accounts. I think already uh, it's clear that on their basis, you can move to uh, a conclusion of focusing on a one state reality or one state solution or sticking to the two state solution. And uh, I guess that will uh, be uh, the topic of uh, further uh, discussion today and tomorrow. Um, but my question is actually on the basis of your experience, where would you see space for such a debate between those two options if you don't want to continue with the status quo? Where do you space, see space for such a debate, either here in Washington or um, on the Israeli and the Palestinian side? Thank you. Let's collect a few questions and then maybe, yeah. Sure. Is there any questions? Okay, so let's do another question here. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I'm very puzzled by the one state solution back then or even now, in that uh, Palestinians have somewhat higher birth rate than Israelis, and, and the Israeli birth rate is flat or declining. Um, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that by the end of this century, you're then looking at a situation where Palestinians uh, would be the dominant population in the unified state. And I'm, I'm wondering, do they not teach uh, de demography in, in, in Israel anymore? And what are these guys thinking? One more maybe? Let's, yeah. let's go take a third one over there. <laughs> Um, just today, uh, the, U the U.S. announced that Israel has been admitted into the U.S. Uh, into the U.S. visa waiver program, and I was wondering in what light we could see this announcement vis-a-vis um, -vis what's happening right now, um, the, the Biden administration's relationship with the Netanyahu um, 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 administration and the, the the events that are happening there, um, as well as the escalation in the in the in the West Bank. Um, so yeah, how can we see uh, that development looking forward? Thank you. Okay, why don't we uh, start with those three questions? Um, I don't know who wants to tackle what first. Uh, I'll. I'll do all three, but I'll combine the first two. Um, look, official Washington has made clear since, at least since Madrid, that the United States supports a two-state solution. Uh, and to the extent that our diplomacy has been focused on that, that's been the objective. Creating space for that discussion in the region is really up to the parties themselves. The debate within Israel, Shlomo can talk to that. The debate within Palestine, Omar can talk to that. Uh, polling indicates that there still is not a majority in either of those two constituencies for the idea of a one state outcome. Uh, there's now discussion of a one state reality which stops short of it being an agreed outcome. But that also has to be part of the discussion. Are the parties ready to accept a reality without signing an agreement on how they're going to govern their future that leaves this asymmetrical imbalance in forces between uh, an Israeli uh, government or an Israeli system that controls uh, all of the land and all of the people between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea? So, you know, I'll let uh, Shlomo and uh, and Omar uh, talked to the, the, the way in which the two societies debate this question, but it's really up to them. Uh, and that would take into account the demography question, uh, especially in Israel. Do, does Israel wanna confront a situation in which there is an equal number of Palestinians and Israeli Jews between the Jordan and the Mediterranean without equality between uh, or among those people? 
On the on the visa waiver question, it's it's a uh, it's been in the works for quite some time, and I'm not sure that it's related to current events. If I were to uh, be asked, I would say it should be, and I'm surprised that the United States, in a sense, wants to reward uh, the current Israeli government with something that they've wanted such a long time. But to the extent that it's data driven, if in fact the data show that uh, Israel qualifies on the basis of uh, entry permits and non-discrimination and so forth, then the timing is awful, but uh, it ends up uh, uh, going into effect. Uh, I hope they also in analyzing the data are looking at uh, visa overstays. Uh, when I was uh, ambassador, uh, our biggest problem uh, after discrimination in uh, entry and in exit, uh, our biggest problem was uh, Israelis who would come to the United States on a visa, but then would overstay their visa and work. And we had one applicant who uh, started crying when her visa was turned down because she said she had a job waiting for her. Well, she was told you're not allowed to have a job if you're on a tourist visa, but we had that was a large problem that we faced. And I, I just hope they've taken that into account as well. Uh, Ahmed and Shlomo, would you like to weigh in? Shlomo, would you like to go ahead? Yes, uh, perhaps uh, I should start with a brief, brief remark about what uh, uh, Dan said about uh, the need for Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, to look uh, uh, in the mirror. I think that going through my presentation, you would see uh, there is an asymmetry. There has been an asymmetry here in terms of looking in the mirror. I address the fact that Israelis only looked at the security dimension of the process, not at the, 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 the substantive issues of Palestinian nationalism that needed to be that addressed. Israelis looked at the solution for the problems of 67, uh, not 1948. They could not address it. Uh, the incapacity to conceive uh, the real solutions, the fact that they went unilateral, the policy of settlements, uh, the, the emphasis on autonomy rather than on standhood, the settlers being land hungry, I didn't hear anything that uh, uh, resembles looking in the mirror in uh, Dajani's uh, presentation, except the fact that uh, he was very generous to share with me this, uh, uh, this meeting. Now, um, as to uh, the question of demography, the question of demography is essential, as I said. I mean, you just need to read again my presentation. I spoke about the question of demography. Uh, being what I believe has been the original DNA of Zionism that has been uh, turned on its head by the current coalition and by, in fact, by the by the Israeli right that has gained power thanks to the deceptions of the peace process. Uh, there is this is another lesson uh, for future or would be peacemakers. Uh, there isn't a peace process without a political backbone. If your backbone is broken, then you can write poetry, not make political concessions. And the Israeli political backbone was consistently broken by the peace process. Now, I share every uh, technical reservation about the flaws of Oslo, but I would insist and in fact, I came to it to this conclusion immediately after the end of our experience. I wrote two articles, one in the Newsweek in 2001, and in the uh, Financial Times, where I made my opinion clear that my the lection the the, the lesson I I uh, I drew from uh, from this experience is that there is no way to reconcile Israel and Palestinian narratives. You know, allow me uh, um, um, a comment on historiography. There is this uh, fantastic essay by Isaiah Berlin about uh, historical inevitability. He didn't believe in historical inevitability, and he said much of it 
that is history is driven by political choices, by personal moral choices. I, you know, compared with Isaiah Berlin, who am I? But I would shift slightly the emphasis to the structural issues. I think that it is a structural impossibility for Israelis and Palestinians to reconcile narratives and reach the kind of, uh, I, I, I don't know, I do not dispute the possibility of some kind of Palestinian land being under Palestinian full control, call it sovereignty or, or, or differently. But the kind of two-state solution, and I said it in my presentation, read it, that responds ideally to international legitimacy is utterly unrealistic. We can leave another generation and try again to get this tractor out of the where it is uh, uh, stuck, but it, it, it won't be possible. That's my uh, my view. When it comes to to uh, um, to um, uh, demography, as I said, we are declining into a one-state reality. In fact, this is the reality. And uh, perhaps at some point down the road, an Israeli leader, an Israeli liberal majority would come to office and would not be able to negotiate and create a state in the 1967 borders. This, in my view, is a historical impossibility and some sort of different settlement. And if not, a unilateral disengagement the, the Israeli left, including the two Nobel Peace Prize winners, didn't have the guts to dismantle not even one settlement. Sharon dismantled all the settlements that he had created in the Gaza Strip and was about to start the same process in, uh, in the West Bank. Let me tell you something that I, I, I am very careful when I have to say it uh, publicly. Rabin's assassination was a tragedy for Israeli democracy. Sharon's stroke was a tragedy for a possible disengagement between Israelis and Palestinians. Sh Rabin didn't have the courage to dismantle this hotbed of uh, Jewish extremism and racism in Hebron in the wake of, the, uh, of uh, Goldstein's uh, um, uh, massacre. I can assure you that Sharon went to sleep like a baby the same night that he dismantled 8,000 settlers and started the process in the West Bank. So I believe that this DNA of demography versus territory might prevail in the future, but not to the degree of creating the kind of two-state solution that we had in mind when we went to Ken David and then, and then Clinton peace parameters and then Taba and then the, the, the proposals of Ehud Olmert. Thank, Thank you, Shlomo. You. I think uh, let's uh, hear from Omar and then we'll take a question from Brussels. Uh, great, uh, thanks very much. I, I'd like to speak to two different things. Um, uh, first, uh, taking seriously uh, what, what Dan has urged um, and Shlomo too, um, I want to make two points with regard to uh, uh, Palestinians' own mistakes in the context of this process. I think, first of all, that um, it is undoubtedly true that um, going into the Oslo process, during the Oslo process, and at key uh, 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 junctures uh, toward the end of it, uh, the Palestinian leadership made uh, formidable errors. Um, I uh, uh, wrote an essay in 2003 uh, uh, laying out these um, uh, uh, these mistakes uh, in a book that the United States Institute of Peace published. Um, I uh, will note, first of all, that I think there were um, uh, formidable problems of internal governance that we um, struggled to resolve. Those problems of internal governance uh, caused us to ignore the perspectives, caused the Palestinian leadership in Tunis to ignore the perspectives of Palestinians living inside the West Bank and Gaza Strip, um, to ignore the hard-earned experience of folks 
of Palestinians inside the West Bank and Gaza Strip when designing the Oslo Accords. And even once uh, the PLO had arrived um, in uh, uh, the occupied territory, uh, there was a failure to um, engage uh, the extraordinary resources that were available to us, human resources that were available to us. Um, the uh, Oslo Accords, the interim agreement, which was one of the most important uh, pieces of the Oslo Accords famously uh, was negotiated without uh, the assistance of a uh, strong Palestinian legal counsel, without uh, a clear sense of what the implications were of what was being signed. Um, and um, without, again, uh, the experience of uh, uh, those uh, who were very, very well versed, um, not only in what the circumstances were um, in the occupied territory, but also with the kinds of tactics that had um, undermined Palestinian um, uh, positions and lives in the past. Uh, so I think that that was um, a, uh, a tragic problem. I also think uh, it was um, once the uh, accords began um, and the Palestinian Authority began, the, uh, the authority uh, substituted patronage for participation in politics. Um, and uh, that decision sapped uh, the political vitality of Palestinian um, institutions and made it all the more difficult for Palestinian leaders to discuss the kinds of compromises that were going to be necessary in public. Um, and that in turn created fratricidal uh, competition among uh, Palestinian negotiators who very often um, subverted one another in the context of the peace talks. And that doesn't even get us to the uh, second intifada and the mistakes that were made uh, strategically and morally uh, with regard to the use of violence, uh, not only um, um, against uh, 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 Israeli soldiers, but um, uh, morally, uh, unacceptably against civilians, um, uh, to not apprehend uh, what the costs would be of that strategic uh, decision uh, was another um, cr crucial failing of the Palestinian leadership. But I want to say that as important as these failings were, um, I don't think that um, they are the reason that we talk today about the end of the two-state solution. I don't think that they are the reason why um, it is so incredibly difficult for us to um, attempt to pick up where we left off in 2008, for example. Um, I do agree uh, with, with Shlomo, and I'll turn to this in a moment, that there is a difficult uh, clash of national narratives, um, and that separation um, strikes me as a difficult, as um, uh, an implausible way of addressing that clash of, of narratives. But I don't think that the failings of the Palestinian leadership, um, uh, which I think are understandable when one looks at the broader context in which they were uh, operating, I don't think those failings are the cause of the impasse, uh, the primary cause of the impasse where, where we find ourselves today. A last point, um, I, I think um, with regard to the question of space, that in addition to uh, being a failure of design and implementation, Oslo represented a failure of vision. Um, it was premised on an idea of separation. Uh, the idea as stated in uh, Rabin and Barak's successful campaign slogans, us here, them there, uh, that Palestinians and Jews uh, best could achieve peace um, by building a wall, uh, separating them um, and living apart from each other. Um, and I think that that conception was both um, ahistorical and illiberal. And I think um, it's not surprising that it elicited um, less than enthusiastic reactions among many segments of the Palestinian population um, and gave rise to frankly, um, uh, uh, legitimizing um, racism um, uh, within Israel. I think that Ran is right, that an approach uh, going forward needs to take the imperative of decolonization seriously. Um, but I also think that we've got an array of options available to us beyond um, the separation-based two-state paradigm that, that dominated Oslo and a one-state solution, whether binational um, uh, or otherwise, in which there isn't um, a framework for self-determination for each of those, for each of the peoples. 
Um, I want to commend to the audience um, uh, the movement A Land for All, uh, which um, is undertaking to advance a values-based approach uh, to uh, devising a different kind of two-state solution, one that undertakes to reconcile uh, the uh, desire of both peoples for self-determination um, and the need for equality between Palestinians and Israelis um, and for freedom of movement and residence um, that is responsive to the fact that Palestinians and Israelis both cherish all of the land of uh, Palestine, Israel. Um, I think that there is increasing space for discussion of outcomes of that kind, even if that space remains relatively small. And I would hope that um, Washington uh, would take uh, serious steps uh, to uh, not only hear what Palestinians and Israelis together um, in this movement are calling for, uh, but to push uh, the Israeli government to think more seriously about a, um, a shift of approach. Thanks, Omar. Uh, we have, uh, we're a little bit over. We're going to eat into the break just by a couple minutes, but uh, we're going to take one final question from Brussels. Thanks very much, and allow me to add my uh, my thanks to our panelists and audience, and most importantly to MEI and their staff for, for having made this possible today and tomorrow. Um, now, to abuse my position as um, co-convener, I actually have a question for Ran. Um, I thought the the comparative analysis was really fascinating and something we could chew over for for a long time to come. But what was I thought interesting was not just what Ran mentioned, but what Ran didn't mention in terms of what was important within the South African context. And there was, I don't think, any mention of the international dimension, which um, other, other panelists, including uh, Ambassador Kurtzer and others, have talked a lot about. So I'd be very keen in the time that we have left to hear Rand's perspective on that. Like, did South Africa, did the South Africa experience succeed because there was an international intervention? Or actually, is there an, another missing uh, part of the equation, which was um, uh, international, in this case, in South Africa, international sanctions and other forms of international engagement and solidarity um, with the ANC movement. Thanks. Uh, Rand, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good observation. I didn't talk about the international dimension deliberately because I don't think it was important in uh, South Africa, either diplomatic intervention or solidarity campaigns internationally. They were helpful, but the key dynamic, the force that drove the process forward was popular mobilization on the ground. Week after week, month after month, day after day sometimes, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, unionist students, community members, church going um, assemblies that made the transition possible. It was not sanctions, it was not boycotts. They were helpful, obviously. It was definitely not the US diplomatic endeavors. It was the work of South Africans themselves. And for me, this is also a lesson that we can um, borrow for Israel-Palestine. We need the massive intervention of Palestinians themselves as the main stakeholders in a change of the situation and of progressive Israelis. And without that, no solution will ever come forward. We cannot rely on the US. We have 30 years of diplomacy, maybe 75 years of diplomacy that have brought nothing of value to the Palestinians not from the US, not from the European community, not from any other international force. With all due respect to the BDS movement, it's helpful, it's useful, it's a positive step forward, but that's not what's going to make the change. We need the massive intervention of people on the ground. Without this, no solution will ever be possible. I think this is the most fundamental lesson of South Africa. On a related note, I agree with uh, Omar about the importance of considering different alternatives. It's not one state or two state. There is the movement that he mentioned, which is a very uh, conceptually very important, a land for all. There is the notion of binationalism. <clears throat> but we need to start working on these alternatives on the ground, not wait for diplomats, not, definitely not wait for the US or any other international force. 
The only people who can change the situation are Israeli and Palestinians themselves. So that's the main challenge, how to mobilize them for the task that will ensure equal rights to all of them as individuals, but also as national groups, as collectives. Thank you, Ran. And thank you to all our panelists, uh, Dan, uh, Shlomo, Omar, and thank you, Carol, for your moderation. And uh, we're going to move now to a break. Uh, we have about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll reconvene at just after 1045 Washington time.